what would be the effect on culture of learning a linear, sequential, reductionist, and abstract mode of perception, which is what writing is? Now, the first forms of writing were cuneiform and hieroglyphics, which were so complicated that probably not more than 2% of the population learned how to read and write. But then, in between these two countries of Egypt and Mesopotamia, some group figured out an extremely <coughs> easy way to communicate mm -hmm. in writing called the alphabet. Yeah. And yeah. alphabets are so easy to learn that four-year-olds can learn the alphabet. Forrest Gump can learn the alphabet. And suddenly you have this communication tool that holds out the promise of universal literacy. And I maintain that that changed culture. Mm -hmm. And it isn't the content of the books that I'm concentrating on. I maintain that the process of becoming literate is world changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, a literate person has a totally different worldview than a non-literate person. Well, you know, the, the sense of this for me is, is that when one does look into the archaeology and, and the uh, prehistory of uh, Europe and uh, mm -hmm. the, the Middle East, it's, it's well known and, and agreed by scholars that these were all goddess cultures. But right. when we, when I grew up and studied history, in, in school, it was, it was never taught, and I, I guess the reason is that the, the goddess cultures are by and large considered prehistorical, which right. in a sense proves your point, because history itself is said to begin with writing. Exactly, exactly. Well, you know, when you, <coughs> when you communicate, uh, you, let me back up for a moment. The, the basis for this idea has to do with the fact that we humans have a very strange wiring in our brain, and that is that all vertebrates from fish forward have a bilobe brain. And each hemisphere of this bilobe brain pretty much does what the other hemisphere does, except it's its mirror image, except in humans. Humans have something called hemispheric lateralization, where although the two lobes of the brain look very similar, they're actually functionally different. Specialized. Yeah, very specialized. So 90% of language centers reside in the left hemisphere of right-handed people. And to prevent getting bogged down in qualifiers here, I'm just going to talk about right-handed people who are predominantly left-brained. And it's almost as if all of the temporal <laughs> functions, all of the functions that proceed in time, such as language, causality, determinism, logic, you know, reason, all those things are very linear. Mm -hmm. and, and, and all the spatial um, functions, not all of them, but many of the spatial functions reside in the right hemisphere. So that recognizing faces, seeing patterns, seeing the holistic gestalt, and seeing the parts to the whole and their relationship to them is primarily a right hemispheric function. So it's as if the right hemisphere processes information that is holistic, synthetic, concrete, and simultaneous, and the left hemisphere processes information that's linear, sequential, mm -hmm. reductionist, and abstract. Now, <laughs> if I were to show you my watch and say, look at my watch, you would see it instantly, simultaneously, and synthetic. There's yeah. no verbalization necessary to see my watch. But I could go in the other room and write a two-page description of my watch, give it to you to read, and if I was a good writer, you would reconstruct what my watch looked like but now you did this in a totally new way. Now I maintain that every man and woman has a feminine side and a masculine side to their personality, to their psyche, to their mind. And I believe that the masculine side of both men and women is primarily their left hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And the feminine side of both men and women is primarily their right hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So what is the effect on culture of introducing into culture a very powerful communication tool that reinforces only one side. W when I speak to you, mm -hmm. as I'm doing right now, I need both sides of my lips, both vocal cords, both sides of my tongue. In fact, if I've been to the dentist and I've had Novocaine, I can't talk very well. So yeah. I need the cooperation of both hemispheres. As do, I presume, the people right. who are watching us right, right. now. 
And when you're listening to me, your left hemisphere is following what I'm saying in a very linear fashion. Yeah. Word but after your right word. hemisphere mm -hmm. is checking me out. I mean, you're mm -hmm. watching me, you're looking at me, you're seeing whether I seem sincere, whether I, how am I dressed, do I have alcohol on my breath? And there's a whole bunch of nonverbal clues that go into the decision of what I'm saying that are almost as important as what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. When you write, you write with only one hand. Up until the invention of the typewriter, the dominant hand held the stylus, the pen, the chisel, and the left hand was essentially a functional in writing. I mean, if you lost your left vocal cord, you'd have a hard time speaking. But if you lost your left arm, it wouldn't interfere with your ability to write. So, so this is a very profound change. I mean, uh, Alfred North Whitehead said that the uh, processes that advance civilization all but wreck the societies in which they occur. So what, <laughs> what is the effect on culture uh -huh. of introducing a new form of communication? We're witnessing today a, a, a complete discombobulation of our culture due to new media that have been introduced, television and, and radio in the early part of the century and now the internet and all kinds of communication technologies. But this book is sort of follows what Marshall McLuhan said, that the medium is the message, that, that a technology of information transfer embeds itself in our psyche and it stealthily exerts an influence on the way we think. And I think that, that, uh, that the alphabet mm -hmm. changed the way people envision their reality. Mm -hmm.